Welcome everyone to our Tech Excellence uh, Meetup. Our vision is to raise the bar of technical excellence across the world. Uh, the following uh, is our or organizational team. So it includes Daniel, Oliver, Alina, and also myself. The following is a list of some of our past speakers as well as future upcoming speakers for this year. And uh, please make sure that you've joined us on Meetup. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, GitHub, and uh, join our discussions on Discord. Also, thanks to our sponsors, Optivum, and our partner, QE Unit. So, uh, for today, I am really excited that we are being joined by Paul Hammond who is director at Pact Software. And his presentation today is Component-Driven Development with React uh, and DOM testing. Feel free to write any questions within chat at any time. We will be answering your, your questions uh, at the end of the session. So I'm really looking forward to this. I think we will all learn a lot. So uh, looking forward to it, Paul. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Good. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. So I do have quite a lot to get through today. Um, it's going to be quite uh, a hands-on session. We're going to take a look not just at testing. That's going to be one of the main focuses of the talk. But we're also going to talk about um, overall quality, how we build quality into our front ends using modern tooling and techniques. A lot of the, uh, you'll, you'll often hear me talk about React and things like Storybook. Um, just to be clear on this one, because I spend most of my time working uh, with React, but actually um, many of the tools and techniques that I'm going to uh, discuss would apply to any front, any modern front, front end framework. So Vue, Angular, Svelte, all of those. Um, and all of the techniques themselves that I'm going to discuss are completely um, framework agnostic. We are going to talk a lot about testing and how to write tests that are resilient to changes. Um, but as I said, you want to kind of give this fuller picture, um, mostly just to explain how everything kind of fit, fits together and how we think nowadays in terms of components and why we do that. So uh, a little bit about myself. Um, so I've been working in the industry for about 15 years or so. Um, for about 10 of those years, I've been doing test-driven development pretty much day in, day out. Um, when I first started learning about test-driven development, I, in those days, I watched a video by a, a guy called Ian Cooper. He had a video online around 2013, I think it was, um, called Test-Driven Development, Where Did It All Go Wrong? In that video, he talks about how lots of teams try to do test-driven development. Uh, they, they'll, you know, they try, they try to do it, but they, find that they don't get the returned uh, value, promise, promise value. Um, he, he basically talks about this and he says that one of the main reasons for this is because people are too uh, concerned about what a unit is. So they think about a unit as uh, a unit is an individual piece of code. It's a function or it's a class or, or whatever. And, and they think that they need to test this unit in isolation. And in order to test that unit in isolation, you mock out all of the collaborators to that unit. What ends up happening when people take that approach is that they end up writing tests that are very tightly coupled to their implementation details. So he recommends taking a different approach. And he basically says that you should be building, uh, writing your test based on behavior, not in implementation details. So I started at the very beginning of my kind of TDD part of my career about 10 years ago with that advice in mind. And I was getting the instant value, like an instant return on value. I was seeing that we could refactor things with really high confidence. The bugs just went down. I was getting rapid feedback and it was just working. And I started using React. Um, so a little, little bit more about my, myself, I guess. We, I worked at Electronic Arts, BBC Sport. When I was at BBC Sport, we started, we were early adop adopters of React in around 2014, I think it was. And I started testing React components in this way, the way that I'm going to show you now, um, from the early days. And it worked really well. So 
the fundamental thing that I really, fundamental message that I really want to get across is that I believe that the purpose of good tests is to give us the confidence to make changes over time. And the rest of the talk really is about how to make that happen. Um, so what we're going to do, this is going to be quite hands-on. I'm going to start with um, talking about component-driven development, why we think nowadays in terms of components rather than complete pages uh, or complete applications, uh, how tools like React help us with that, and then how we can use tools like Storybook for UI development. I'll go into, we're going to have hands-on demos of all of this stuff. And we're then going to, we're then going to move on to DOM testing and the testing library suite. I'm going to show some misconceptions about DOM testing. We're going to talk about how the DOM, uh, testing via the DOM helps with accessibility, how it avoids implementation details, and how, how we can um, avoid changes with uh, designs causing problems in our tests and things like that. Um, we're also going to talk about mocking API calls with mock service worker. I'm going to show how that works. We can do some pretty exciting things with uh, with that technology we can um you, i'll show you as we as we go through but we can do things like um mocking using the same mocks in our tests um, and in the browser itself uh, but i'll show you how that works then we're going to bring it all together and we're going to look at a product search feature uh, again it's going to be hands-on i'll show you the code and um, how it all works and we're going to talk about how we test that and we're also going to do two refactorings in this uh, talk. Or I'm going to dem demonstrate two refactorings and show how the test can help us. So we're going to refactor a relatively simple component at first, but then we're going to refactor a much more complicated one. Or I'm going to show how our tests uh, help us to do that uh, towards the end. And then hopefully there'll be time at the end um, to talk a little bit about a backend pattern that I think works really well and um, that helps us to um, simplify things on the front end uh, we'll go through that so i'll go through the slides relatively quickly because I, I do want to get to the the good bit really but um yeah the again the key point is we want to see how we make uh, changes over time uh, how tests help us make changes over time and we are going to kind of go through the full flow so i know i've probably already said this about three times already but um this is the real key take-home point for me that good tests should give us the confidence to make changes over time it, it's it's hard to stress this enough. If you if you have worked in an environment where tests actually do work this way and do give you the promised value, then it's a really liberating thing because not only do you find out very quickly when you broke something, but your confidence is always very high. So I've written here that if our tests are passing, we should feel confident enough to go straight to production. This is something that I really believe, and I've done this at scale before. We did this at the BBC for a while when we are building the new football scores and things like that. And I've seen this working in practice, uh, and I know it can work. So, yeah, I'm not going to, this is a little bit wordy, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to skip through this a little bit. But um, I just want to explain why we're not starting straight with um, tests right at the very beginning. Because I do want to talk a little bit first about how, how the process works, how we, um, in, in a modern kind of environment, how we design components, how we build them, and how we document them. Um, and how we can build these in isolation. There's kind of two forms of testing here. So we're going to be talking about how to test individual React components, but also how to test when you pull into an application, because it's slightly different. And I'll, I'll talk about that. So a little bit about component-driven development. Um, so modern front ends are built with components and not pages. Um, we often use. UI libraries like React to do that. I'll uh, talk about, uh, I'll give some examples shortly. This screenshot here is from a, um, an application called Storybook, which uh, this is the GitHub version of Storybook. And what this is showing us is their, their library. I think it's called Primer. If you Google GitHub Primer Storybook, you can see this. And it will take you to uh, a page where you can interactively play with all these components. It will document them all. Um, and it's really you know, using these techniques, we can share these components across an entire estate. Of course, if you're going to do that, so when I say across an entire estate, what I mean is that um, it can be across multiple applications if you want, if, if that's if that's what you want. Um, so component-driven development helps us to build reusable components that reduce duplication. It's going to help us with consistency so that um, designers and Developers can collaborate more easily. You can build these components in isolation and, and share them. 
helps us with accessibility. We're going to talk about accessibility next, and I'm going to start um, a demo with accessibility in a moment. Um, we can rapidly prototype things. You build up a collection of components which you can compose together in an in, in easy kind of way. Um, and yeah, we can integrate with tools like Storybook, where we can visualize and interact with them. So we're nearly at the uh, demo stage here, but I just want to, I'm not going to read this slide word for word, but when it comes to building front end, we have different concerns to what we might have on the back end. There are a few fundamental things that are just completely unique to the front end. So two of the main ones are, there's the visual look and feel. Obviously, we have to care about how things actually look and what the user experience is, is like for, for users, but also um, accessibility. And um, depending on, most people think about screen readers, that's the obvious choice when you're talking about accessibility, but there's loads of different types of assistive technologies that can help people with all kinds of different problems. Um, yeah, so thinking in terms of uh, components and component libraries, if we if we build our components in an accessible way, then we get that kind of benefit and we get that reuse, you know, it expo exponentially grows across our estate. So I'm gonna start with a demo on a modal component. Um, and we're gonna talk initially about accessibility when it comes to a modal. So um, I just want to show here, so I've got a little um, application that I, I built here so I can just kind of quickly show different demos. So I'm gonna click on this um, modal link and what I have here, so I'm just going to go to, sorry, keep this in the same tab. What's going on there? I'll go here. Okay, so um, I'm not going to read this entire page, but I'm, I just want to open this just to show you that. So this is a W3C uh, web accessibility guide. On this page, we, we, we have instructions that to help us to make modals, and, and it will tell us what kind of kinds of things we need to do to make sure that our modal is accessible. Now you can see here, there's quite a lot going on. Maybe more, if you don't spend much time in the front end space, it might be surprising how much work actually goes into these things. If I click on patterns here, you can actually see that there's a lot of uh, different advice for different patterns. So I just wanna focus on one thing here, which is this one. I'll zoom in a little bit, um, but I'm just gonna read this one requirement here. So this says, like non-modal dialogues, modal dialogues contain their tab sequence. That is, tab and shift tab do not move focus outside the dialog. However, unlike most non-modal dialogues, modal dialogues do not provide means for moving keyboard focus outside the dialog window without closing the dialog. So what does that actually mean? So I've got two examples of a modal on this page. One of them is an inaccessible version and the other is an accessible version. So this is the inaccessible version. So I click on this and I get this kind of pop-up, uh, this kind of modal. Watch what happens here. So if you see, if you see my focus, if you can see around this cross now, I'm that's my focus. When I hit tab, I'm going to tab into the input field, and then I'm going to tab you know, onto a button. If I hit tab again, notice how I end up completely outside. And if there were other elements on this page, like input fields or whatever, I would be on those elements now. Now the problem with this is this is this might not seem like a problem if you're um, an able-bodied user and you're just using the website like most users because you can see what's what's happening here. But if you're using the website exclusively through a screen reader, it's not obvious where you are. You might have some blocking uh, action that you need to take here, but you, you don't know that you're even in a modal because you've tabbed out of it and it's not explaining this to, to a um, screen reader user. So let's compare that to an accessible version of a modal. So if we see this accessible version, saying this looks similar, but if you see what I'm going to do now, if you see my focus, I'm going to focus through. I'm going to click on um, focus on the button. I'm going to hit tab again and see how my focus stays within the modal. This is called a focus lock, and this is what that um, requirement that we were just looking at was. Um, so, by having a, a component that can enforce these kind of rules, and we don't have to think about it once it's made for us, um, it's extremely. You can see how powerful this could be because we're going to get these accessibility wins and it's not actually as trivial as you might think to, to do these kind of kinds of things there's actually even more to it behind the, the scenes it will actually have some area labels under the hood that will announce to screen readers that, that you're in a modal and things like that and that's all going on under the hood as well um, but <clears throat> you can look at a component like this and say well okay 
that's fine. But let's say that we want to make this into a reusable uh, component. In be before tools like React came along, this is actually quite a difficult problem to solve because it's all very well when you've got this exact design. But what if we wanted to change the design of this component slightly? What if we wanted to move this button, I don't know, from here to the top, or we wanted to show an image in here, or we wanted to have you know, di a different functionality inside the modal itself? How do we handle that? Well, in prior to tools like React coming along, maybe you would have some kind of config object, and you would maybe say, I don't know, if you wanted to move the button on top, you'd maybe have, um, maybe you'd have a Boolean, which is button on top, true, false, or maybe you'd have, uh, you know, button position, top, bottom, left, right, whatever. But that opens up an even bigger problem because if you imagine that you're in a, a larger state, say you're working at a big company uh, and there's multiple applications and you want to have single, ideally single component library that people can uh, reuse, um, that becomes a problem because we don't want the designers to have to think of every single permutation and every single variant up front. So how do we handle that? So that takes me on to the next point here, which is another demo inside the modal, which is composition. Um, so I want to talk about how tools like React help us to build complex UIs out of smaller building blocks. So let's go back to our modal example. And I'm going to stick this on that side. Hopefully you can all see. And I'm going to stick this here. And what I'm going to do is, should be able to open up the code. So I've got an accessible modal example. So the code on the left-hand side is the actual um, implementation for this modal. The key thing here, and this is really what made React so kind of revolutionary, in my opinion, when it first came out, is the fact that we as consumers of this component, we have the control over the final render. So if I want to move this around, I can just literally, you know, if I want to put this button on top, I can take this button, I can just move it and stick it there and I can hit save and it's going to move the button for me. It's it's going to maintain that behavior. The focus lock is still there. I still can't come out, but I can do whatever I want here. I can take, I can get rid of a field if I want. That's fine. I can move them around as you, you might expect. Uh, and what's also kind of interesting here, a little subtle thing, and we'll see this in a moment, this text input here is itself a custom component that, that I've made. We'll, we'll talk about this. But the, the real power here is that we have control over the final render as a consumer, and we can compose together components. We can compose these smaller components to build these um, larger, more complex user interfaces. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next thing that I wanna talk about. So this is um, component explorers, um, in this instance, Storybook. So, I, in the same way that you'll probably hear me say React when I really mean any kind of front end, uh, modern front end framework, you'll hear me talk about Storybook, but really what I'm talking about is component explorers because Storybook is not the only one, but it's the one that I've used certainly for about the past five years in my career. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, modern UIs contain countless different state permutations, different browsers need to um, use them. Uh, we have loads of different states for different components. A component and explorer helps us to, to isolate the UI concerns from the business logic and the application context. What we can do is we can build uh, and document uh, these components in isolation. So I'm gonna show you, I've got actually, oh, oh, and sorry, another key point here. Storybook itself is a hosted, well, sorry, it's a static application that you can host. Um, in many places that I've worked, what will happen is when you merge the mainline, if you do trunk-based development, which is what I, usually advocate. Uh, if you merge the mainline, um, it's going to kick off a build and it will create a storybook that the whole, ideally maybe the whole organization shares. Um, if you are working in a PR flow, you can even have um, like an ephemeral version of, of storybook built just for your PR, which you could then share as developers. You could share that with designers and stakeholders and ask them for early feedback. Um, so I'm going to show storybook now. So let's just go back here. Uh, I'm going to close everything else. Just one second. Okay, so storybook. So I, what I've done here is I've basically built, because um, I really wanted to demonstrate this. So what I've actually done is I've built a uh, example shared library. I should I should mention that the um, the link for this we can we can maybe share the link in the chat at some point. But um, I have put this uh, repository online so you can view the code in your own time, and I've documented stuff so you can poke away at it in your own time. 
Um, but essentially what I'm trying to do here is to simulate having a, um, a shared library that we would document in something like, in a tool like Storybook. So I just want to show you some stuff here. So um, when I say that it's interactive, like these are true interactive components, I can go in here and I, I can change things. So I can just say, you know, hello world and change that in real time. You can have, you know, you might have components that have awkward states to reach in an app. So loading states, that kind of thing. You could show them in any state you want. So here, for example, I've got an input uh, component and here I'm showing input with an error displayed. And again, you can you can just change this in real time. So, you know, please type your name. Uh, I can go in here and I can change my, uh, I can give it an error state. So um, error, whatever, um, and it will render that for you. Um, Oh, the other thing to mention here, um, let me, in fact, let me go to the next slide, but I'll just show you, I'll show you, um, I'll come back to this. So yeah, this is a this is the, a flow that works really well for me personally, um, because Storybook itself is, it's also an, in, it, it, it works in real time. So if you change something, you'll see the update instantly um, on the page. So the way that I tend to build things is I work with, Usually, if I'm building a brand new component, what I will do is I'll build the HTML and CSS first. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. Let me go away. Uh, I'll build the, um, the HTML and CSS uh, in isolation first. Um, and then what's nice about that is that I can potentially share that. That's a shareable state at that point in time. So I could share that with a, a designer or whatever and, and just have them look at the, um, the design and say that they're happy with it. Then what I start doing is I build the behavior after that point, and that's when I start test driving. So that's when I use tools like Jest and React Testing Library um, to start adding behavior to the design. Not everybody works in that way, and you don't have to work in that way, but it's a flow that works particularly well for me. So I sometimes jokingly refer to it as storybook-driven development. Um, I think, I don't know if he's on the call, but um, Adam Bulmer also, I think he claims that he came up with that. I don't know if he did, but anyway. Um, yeah, and so um, what, what typically happens for me though is the flow would look something like this. So I would test drive the behavior of the component itself. Uh, then the component and its various states get documented in Storybook. And then after that point, you can then pull the component into an application. Uh, and then I do a TDD flow when I do that as well. When I'm test driving the component, I test all the edge cases and so on for the component itself. When I'm testing through the application, I'm usually testing the a, a specific feature. And so I'll be pulling in a component that is part of that feature. And so I'll test the part uh, of the feature that, if that makes sense, I'll test it through the feature. Um, it's also worth mentioning here that this isn't always the flow because sometimes um, you might you might not want to share a component across an entire state. It might be specific to your application, in which case uh, it is possible to have your an application as well with its own storybook and to you know you don't always have to make them completely globally shareable. But this is a general flow that works well for me. So now I want to talk about DOM testing and the testing library suites. Uh, I've got quite a few demos here, so I'm just going to have a quick glass of water. Um, Okay, so one of the things that I do want to mention when it comes to the testing library suite and uh, how it works is that, and again, I, I often refer to it as React testing library, but it is actually framework agnostic. Well, at its core, you know, the foundation is framework agnostic. The reason for that is because what actually happens is um, all of the variants of uh, the testing library suite, so React testing library, Vue testing library, and so on, uh, are based on top of the foundational DOM testing library. So there's just a thin layer that helps you do rendering in the specific framework. But then from that point on, everything else is the same API for all frameworks, and uh, you're actually testing against the DOM, not a framework. So when it comes to React, and I'll show this, but when it comes to React, we'll have a render uh, call in the test. That's the only React part. From that point onwards, you're basically dealing with a, a, a DOM and your tests don't know or care. So um, you're actually using React under the hood. Um, so yeah, we have this consistent API. Encouragement of best practices. So when I first started in, in React, very early on, there was a tool called Enzyme that was built. Uh, for testing, and a lot of people used Enzyme. 
Enzyme allowed you to do this really, um, I don't, <laughs> well, I don't want to say anything too, too, you know, bad, but let's just say that um, it allowed very kind of implementation level uh, testing. And people would often write these um, tests that would test the internal state of React components and things like that. And it doesn't, doesn't work very well, doesn't scale very well. You end up with tests that prevent you from moving with confidence. And that's that's the whole point of having good tests is that they help you to move with confidence over time. So we'll we'll just we're just going to demo this anyway. Um, so why why test through the DOM? Um, the main thing is that it's it, the highest the, the main reason is confidence. Um, we're going to be testing as if uh, interacting with components and features uh, as a real user would. So as I say, it's implementation agnostic, but I, I'm, you don't have to just take my word for it because I'm going to demo all of these things. So maintainability and test um, accessibility testing, we're going to do that. So yeah, um, yeah, often people think that testing through the DOM is going to be expensive in terms of speed, in terms of designs not being able to uh, adapt, uh, and in terms of um, uh, well, I mean, you, you, just just in terms of general kind of flexibility, uh, I'm going to show a few techniques here to prevent these from being problems. When it comes to speed specifically, um, we're using an in-memory. So the way that Jest and React Testing Library work, Jest is the test runner, and Jest has underneath the hood it has an in-memory representation of the DOM, which generally runs very quickly. Um, it's called JS DOM. And if you're running in this way, usually the tests are very kind of rapid, uh, as, we'll, as we'll see. So we're going to start by talking once again about accessibility, and because I want to, again, connect this idea between the way we're testing and the value that we're, we're getting back. And accessibility is one of the core things that React Testing Library um, helps us with. So let's go in here. So we're going to look at... Uh, yeah, sorry, for this example, this is actually going to be our input field. So I'm going to go here. So uh, let me just let me just uh, remove this. I'm just going to reset this back to where we were. So there's um, with an input field, there's a, a slight um, advantage. Sorry, there's a, a an accessibility concern straight away um, in that if I were to click this label now, so I'm going to click it, do you see how this takes us into the uh, input field itself? The reason this works this way uh, is because under the hood, we, we are connecting the, we, we have a for attribute, which connects the label to the um, to the input field itself. One thing that I didn't show before actually is um, you can click on docs view here. And if you're using TypeScript, you will see, uh, you can click and show code and it actually shows you. So you can see here, the way that this component works is if you add a label, it will automatically create um, uh, an accessible label for you. So um, let's have a quick look at how the tests work for uh, for the input field. So I need to be here. And so before I even start, what I've got here is I'm running these. This, this here is my test runner, uh, which is uh, Jest. And what I'm going to do, I'm in this interactive watch mode. So if I go into, let's have a look in my input field for a moment. If I change anything in here at all, I'm just going to add some text or whatever. You'll see that it runs the tests, um, and they should run pretty quickly, as you can see. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to just focus specifically on the input test. So I'm in this interactive runner. I press a button, and I can just literally filter in. So I can say input, and that's going to run just the input tests. So if I go to my input test, let's have a look. Um, so the way I'm just going to close the test runner down for a moment. I will zoom in. Obviously, I'm a little bit restricted in terms of space here. So as I'm showing the test, I'll have to zoom out a bit more. But um, I'm just going to show here. So I've got um, what am I actually doing here? So I, I pull in the input component directly. I'm using testing library, and it's the React variant. So that gives me a React compliant, if you like, a render uh, function. Uh, which I can then use. And screen is, is the API that allows us to um, run queries against the DOM. Um, so what I'm doing here is, if you see, rather than pulling the component by inspecting through an ID or a class, as, as people as historically would, um, I'm using this library, uh, React Testing Library, and it comes with a, a suite of uh, accessible selectors. What this is actually doing is, it's going to return the input field itself. So it's going to return to me, literally this input field. 
But it does it through the association with the label text, and it will only do it if the label text is correctly associated. Um, if that makes sense, so I can I can show that, and just just to show, look, so we pass in the expected label here, and then we we use that same label to to pull out the um to to get the input field. So what I'm just going to do, so just before I show you this, sorry, one thing that I should have shown you before I even do this, I'm just going to go screen debug just to show you what I mean when I say virtual DOM. You see here, do you see how we get the actual HTML? Um, here, so we actually have access and we are rendering the component. But at this point, it's not React. At this point, it's it's a DOM. I mean, it technically gets managed by React, but as we're, we're interacting with the DOM. And as far as the tests are concerned, it doesn't matter that React is used. It's, it's kind of agnostic. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to deliberately go under the hood, and I'm going to break the code. So how I'm going to do this, I'm just going to, so you can see here, what I do is I generate an ID. I put the, this ID on this for attribute for this label, and then I associate it with the ID of the input field. If I break this connection, uh, just like this, hit save, and you'll see test fail. But why does it fail? It says, and I'll just read this out because again, I'm, I do have on the limited screen real estate, but um. Uh, found a label with text of name. However, no form control was found associated to that label. Make sure you're using the for attribute uh, correctly. And you'll see here, look, if I go in here now and I click on this label, I'm clicking it now, and there's no longer an, an association. So this is actually broken. So by using these um, this suite of accessible selectors, you get this implied uh, improvement in terms of your testing because you're going to be um, it, 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 there's an implied accessibility check. Um, so that's that's the first demo there. So I'm just going to, if you just give me one moment, I'm just going to revert what I've just done. Um, for my tests again. Sorry about this. Test, there we go. Okay. Um, and what I'm just going to do now is, let's just see what the next demo is. So, <clears throat> yeah. Next demo is. Um, yeah, so this is where it gets really interesting because this is a test. This is proving, well, or, or demonstrating that we can write tests that test for behavior, not implementation details. I say this a lot to people. Um, it feels quite nice actually to now have an example where I can I can show you what I mean. So let, let's do that. So what I've got here is um, I've got a basic counter component. Sorry, I do need to drink some water. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so I've got a basic counter component, very simple. All it does, I've got an increment, I can decrement. If I try to decrement when I'm uh, in a count of zero, I can't continue. Uh, if I reset, it resets as you'd expect. Relatively straightforward. Um, let's look at how the tests work for this. So I'm going to go to my counter component tests. Run something else down. I'll zoom in again. When I run the tests, I will have to zoom out, but um, just uh, to help. So what I'm doing here is I have a few tests here. In fact, let's let's we, if we run them all. Let me just run. Um, I think I need to be here for this one. Let me counter. Here you go. So you can see initial count is zero. Increment button increases the count. Decrement decreases. Uh, doesn't decrease below zero. Reset resets the count, all right? So how do we actually test it? Okay, so the initial state is quite simple. We just render it, prove that it begins with a zero. Regular expression here. Um, that's fine. Then we say we increment button increases the count. We're using a library called user event, which is bundled with uh, a React testing library. Um, or, or not React testing library, sorry. It's bundled with testing library. It's kind of uh, interesting because this isn't part of React testing library because it's actually testing against the DOM. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, but what it does is it allows us to simulate. It's, it's really neat, actually, the way the user event library works because it will do clever things for you. Like if you are typing, for example, it will simulate a short delay as you're typing and little subtle things like that that um, you know would otherwise be quite difficult to test. But anyway, to increase the uh, count, what are we doing? So we have a, another accessible selector. We're saying get by roll button. So it has to be a button with the name of increment. Um, so that's how we get the button. Then we click it and we, we prove that the value goes to one. Decrement button is it's very similar. So what we do is we increment, we go to one, we then click decrement, we go to zero. 
uh, decrement button doesn't decrease below zero. So we know we begin at zero, click decrement, we don't, we don't go down. And again, very similar for uh, the reset button. But what's interesting here is that, let's look at the implementation uh, behind this. If I go to the counter. So I got, so the implementation we're looking at right now is this one. Uh, I'm not, this isn't really a React tutorial as such. So I'm gonna, I'm not really gonna go into the detail too much other than to say that the way that this is working is we're implementing this through uh, the React use state mechanism. And essentially what happens is we, you, you click and uh, yeah, we just use use state, which is fine. But I've got another implementation of the same component, uh, which is, let me find it, use reducer. So just to show you, I um, the way that this works is we, we're using use reducer. So this isn't actually Redux. Re, um, React comes with use reducer these days. And so it's the exact same functionality, but a totally different implementation, as you can see. And just to prove it, this is the reducer version, and it's exactly the same. Yeah, exactly the same. And you can see that I use reducer implementation. What I'm going to do now, though, if let me just run this, and I'm going to just zoom out a little bit. Sorry. Hopefully, people can see that. Um, notice this import at the top. What I'm actually doing is I'm pulling in the use state version of the counter, then I'm renaming it uh, as counter. And then you can see all the tests run against that implementation. But now I'm going to totally change the implementation by putting, pulling in use reducer counter. I run the tests and they all pass. They all pass because the functionality works. It doesn't matter how it's implemented. We're testing behavior, not implementation. But let's prove that. Let's prove that there's no smoke and mirrors involved. So if we go into here and we can so use reducer implementation and let's just change the increment. Uh, in, instead of the increment, we'll go, well, we'll minus instead of incrementing plus. Um, you can see that that failed, and we've got three tests that fail as a result because uh, we're actually simulating the behavior each time. So that, that sounds about right. And let's just see uh, this version of the counter now, if I increment, is actually decrementing. So it's in a broken state, whereas the other one still works. Um, so hopefully that kind of illustrates that point that we're not testing implementation details, we're testing against uh, behavior. And as a result, it's one of the things that can be so liberating about this kind of way of working because you can end up in a position where your tests help you. Because if you're if you're moving if you're working in this way where your tests are running in a watch mode like this, every time you make a change, you you hit save, you're going to see instant feedback. So if you break something, you find out in a split second. Um, and you know I break stuff all the time when I'm developing, but I find out very quickly and fix it very quickly. Uh, and this is why. Uh, and it's that combined with test first. Okay, so oops, hang on, we're going to demo another thing now. So in a similar vein, um, I want to also show how we don't need to be tied to the visual look and feel of the user interface. So we've, we've seen how we don't have to be tied to the behavior, but how can we not be tied to the visual look and feel? Because that's obviously comes with the territory of um, working on the front end. So in order to do that, I just need to do the same thing. I'm just going to reset everything. Just give me one second. There we go. I'm going to run my tests again. Um, and now we've got another example, which is this form. Uh, so some basic functionality in this form, nothing special. I'll show you how it works. It's, I'm kind of cheating a little bit, but it's just to uh, show. So if I type in my name and an email address and a password, doesn't matter what the password is, and I hit enter, uh, form submitted. So that just simulates, I wanted to have some behavior in there just to illustrate the point here. So simulates that the um, form submission was successful. What I'm gonna do now is a similar thing, but I'll just type in the name, email address, oops, email address, and then I'm not gonna type in a password. I'm just gonna click submit, and then we get password is required. So under the hood, let's just see how that works. So we've got form example. And yeah, like I say, I, I'm kind of cheating here just to illustrate the point. So when, when it's submitted, if there's a password, we say it's true. If only all code was as easy to write as this. Um, yeah, and then otherwise we uh, set an error. Um, so that's all well and good. And then I can run the tests again for this. So I'm just gonna run form. My tests will run. Yep, um, and so we just see that, yeah, we can submit the form, we can display a password error. 
that's fine. Um, so what I'm going to do now, and again, I am I am quite restricted for space here, so apologies for that, but hopefully this will at least illustrate the point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to split this top and down just to show you what I mean here. So you can see the design of this thing. So here are my tests. Here's my implementation. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to start moving things around. I'm going to change the, the look. Uh, and you should see that the test will continue to pass as long as the behavior works. So I'm going to take the button and I'm just going to move the button to the top. Hit save. Button moves to the top. Test still pass. It will still work. It's still going to be working. Uh, I can reorder things. Um, so I can take this and put this down here. Whatever. Test still pass again because the behavior is still working. I can change the CSS if I want. So I'll go in here and class name. Uh, I can say background color red. Mm, let's say 500, is that right? Yeah, hit save. There you go, changes the background color. Change the look and feel, but the behavior still works, so the test still passed. But if I go in and I break the actual behavior of this thing, so let's go in and I'll just break that, hit save, and you can see my test fails. And why does it fail? It fails because, I'll just zoom in a minute. Uh, I mean, well, it's, it's the can display password required error. And you follow that through and figure out what's going on. And just to prove again, uh, if we now go in here and I just refresh this and I just type in, uh, it doesn't need to be an email address. Da, da, da. And then anything here, uh, I don't get the error. I'm now submitting, I don't get the error. Uh, and again, just to prove when we change the design, if I just now save it, now it works again. Um, come. So um, just to illustrate this point, hopefully this, this little diagram kind of helps to il illustrate this. So what's actually happening here is that React testing library triggers the initial render, and that's the, the only part of the library that is React specific. Um, then what happens is the component itself can have whatever logic it needs inside it. It can be pulling in other libraries. This is, this is the really key thing, and this, is, this gets me back to the Ian Cooper thing where I'm not testing these internals. I'm not testing if, if a library is used to produce this, the behavior that ultimately renders in the DOM, my test shouldn't need to know or care how this works internally, just know that it works. Um, and so, and yeah, and so what happens is once it's rendered, the React component ultimately renders to the DOM, testing library tests against the DOM using these resilient queries. And again, just to drill the point home, that it's really kind of a black box. This is really React Testing Library's kind of view of the world. So what happens is triggers a render, then it doesn't really know what's going on, doesn't know, like I don't know or care how you do it, but you produce a DOM for me and then I can run tests against it. Another thing to, to mention actually is that the DOM and the HTML structure are not the same thing. Uh, it's not the same to, when we talk about testing in the DOM, the DOM is a, it's a um, tree-like, representation of the HTML structure with an API on top that allows you to interact with uh, the underlying structure. And the selectors that we're using from React Testing Library give us uh, a neat way of writing tests that uh, are not tied to the visual look and feel and are not tied to, um, basically flexible and hopefully accessible um, if you use the correct ones. So, uh, that's yeah, and it's key to make, helping us write tests over time that you know that can make changes. So, okay, now we're going to talk about uh, mock service worker. Um, and so, what is mock service worker? I, I appreciate, by the way, that I'm going through so many things here. Um, I am going to share the um, code at the at the end. There's a repository of everything in it, and I'm more than happy um, if people have access to that. Um, I, I can't see the chat right now, so uh, I don't know if the link's been shared or not. But when it when it's shared, if you're able to star it and just um, ask me any questions, go in the issues tab or whatever, and ask me questions on there, and I'll I'll answer them. It's fine. But you can see all the code under there. So I appreciate I'm going through a lot, but I hope that it's valuable just to give you this kind of insight. Um, okay, so why are we talking about mock service worker? So the, the thing with this is in you, you know, in most environments, you're gonna be doing things like making API calls. So how do we mock API calls out and stick to this philosophy where we're saying that we don't want to test internals too much. So what mock service worker does, it's a, um, it's a library um, 
which is very neat. It's very clever uh, how it works. And so what happens is um, we can use, we can essentially use the same mechanism to mock requests in the browser as we would on the server. And the, the, the mocks happen at the network. We can, if we want to, you don't have to do it this way, but if you want to, you can use the same mocks for testing stuff in the browser, even building stuff before APIs are ready. If you want to, you can do that. And um, I'll show you an example of this. Um, yep, so I've got an example of that right here. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna open up my network tab and I'll zoom in a little bit, hopefully, you can see this, uh, clear this out. So what's gonna happen when I click this button? And I'll show you the code for this in a second, but what's gonna happen when I click this button is that I'm going to make a API call to actually to an API that doesn't even exist, but I've set up mock service worker in such a way that it will just return data and it's gonna stick the data on the screen. I've also simulated a delay just so you can see a loading state uh, and I'll show you how that works. So I'm gonna click that, see a little loading state and then it dumps this data out. So what's going on here, if I click here, see how this is telling me that there was a request. Let me just take a look. Uh, oh, you know what, I need to zoom out a little bit. Uh, there we go. So here you can see an actual request went out to slash mock service worker demo. And we got a response here with this data in it. And I'll talk you through this in a second and show you um, how this works. But one thing I just want to show is the exact same logic working. Let me get it for you. Oh, I have a test uh, mock service worker example here. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm not really going to talk about this test too much other than to say it renders that same component, clicks the button, and just asserts that some text appears. But what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show you mock service worker example. I think I uh, oh, maybe I'm not displaying it in here. I think I have to go in here one second if we go in here. Yeah, so this is the actual component. And I'm just gonna do this just to show you. Um, so we make an API call using a tool called React Query. Um, again, I'm not really gonna go into the detail about how React Query works, but what is interesting actually, I, I will mention one thing, which is that um, under the hood, I use, so it's a library called React Query, and then I wrap React Query in Axios. Again, I'm not I'm not going to explain this um, too much, other than to just say that this is how this is the mechanism that I happen to be using to call the data, uh, to call the API to then return the data. But it doesn't matter. My tests don't know anything about React Query here. There's nothing about React Query. Oops, so that's not even a test, is it? That's quite above me. Uh, hang on. Yeah, there's my test. But my test doesn't know anything about React Query. It renders the component. Now, um, under the hood, I have set it up so that uh, React, uh, sorry, Mock Service Worker is set up for all tests. And the way that it works, again, I'm not going to go too much into the detail about how to set it up completely, but I just want to show we end up with um, a browser file here, and we end up with a server file, and we have these handlers. And the way that this is currently set up, is if you've ever used Express in um, uh, Node, it's very similar to ex the Express API. And what I've got is here slash get mock service worker demo. Uh, you can see here how I'm simulating that delay. And then I return, this will create a mock uh, products object. And that's the data that you end up seeing on the other end of the 200 status. Um, you can set this up however you want. The, the, the typical way that I've seen work quite well is that you might set up by default uh, a bunch of happy path so, uh, uh, responses, you can override them on a per test basis. And we're gonna show that uh, in a little bit. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to show with mock service worker. I mean, the, the main thing is that we don't care again about the internals here, about how that works. Um, and it's really, again, as I say, you can have this really useful setup, say if, uh, sometimes as a front end team, you might be significantly ahead of the APIs that you depend on. Um, and what you can do in that scenario is you could say, okay, well, we can actually build this thing out. We'll use Mock Service Worker as we're building it out, and you can see everything working in the browser. Um, that's if you want to do it. You can configure it however you want. Okay, so that's that. And where are we now? So bringing it all together. So the product search feature. So what is this? Um, so the product search feature um, is going to involve making a real API call. Um, I said a real API call, similar to what we've just seen. I've not actually got an API returning data, but the components will be doing that. We, 
we're going to look well the, the the flow that i would generally use with this kind of thing is if um if this came to me as a real requirement from ux in a real place that i'm working at the the general flow that we would have is that we would look at this design and usually i mean i like working in really collaborative environments so hopefully we're collaborating early and often we've designed no big handovers please <laughs> um but essentially um in a in a nice environment what we would do is we would take a look at this design together and then we would we would start by looking at the storybook and we say okay what can we reuse right and in this example what i did was i built a composable card example by the way this is all test driven so if you want to actually read the code at the end um i test drove all these components so you can play about with it have a, have a look poke holes if you want have a, have a play with it um, and then what i actually did was i built a a uh, specific version of this component that would be used. So the general version is like really flexible and then specific version is like has a React API around it that you know, is specific to what we would need. Uh, but generally speaking, what I would do is I'd look at the existing storybook in an estate and say, okay, what can we reuse? What do we need to build that's new? Sometimes you would look at it and say, okay, this new thing that we're gonna build is specific to our product. So we don't need to make this shareable across the estate. But sometimes you might build something like this, like a card component uh, that's reusable or potentially reusable. And so you might be able to promote it into a shared library and other people can benefit from it. We need a slightly different setup for our tests um, when we're testing in the uh, at the application level as opposed to the uh, component level. I'll talk you through that in a moment. Um, yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna do uh, well. Well, I'm gonna simulate a refactoring, and I'm hoping. I think I've just about got enough time to. I'm gonna do a little TDD demonstration because for someone who's so obsessed with TDD, it feels really weird that I've not actually shown any TDD yet. But um, I'm hopefully I'm showing you the techniques that um, can make TDD work for you. Okay, so um, what? Well, sorry, my mind just went blank. That's not the. That's not what you want, is it? Um, okay, so let's go into the. Product card. Oh yeah, the, the feature itself. So I'll show you how this works currently. So I've got a built version of it here. Um, and again, I'll just show you. So what, what's gonna happen here? I can type any old thing in here and I can hit search. And again, what happens here, you can see this request goes off um, and you can see I get this response. Another thing that I didn't show a minute ago, can you see here, it actually tells you in the states code that it came from service worker. I'll zoom in a little bit just in case, but um, it actually does tell you that it came. It, it's the response came from uh, a service worker in that instance, um, and so the way that this works. Let's have a look at the test for this. I'm going to go to product search, product search test. So you can probably see from the folder structure, I've got two implementations, but we'll go through this. So what I'm doing right now is I'm looking at the React query. Uh, implementation of this. Now, React Query is a library that I'm a big fan of it. It's it's a really nice library if you're doing, um, if you're doing kind of RESTful stuff in React. I'm not going to go into the detail, but if you haven't used it before, I'd highly recommend Googling it and having a read around. It's really uh, nice. Um, but what I'm going to do, so, so my, my test for this, uh, what do we do? So we begin with, if products are returned, they should, they should be displayed as a list of product cards. Now, I didn't technically need to do this because I'm already I've already set up the um, uh, mocks in such a way that um, I would be returning data anyway. But I just wanted to show how we can actually override on a per test basis whatever we want to return from an endpoint. So what I've done here is I basically said, um, uh, yeah, when the uh, when you make any requirement, uh, sorry, <laughs> any requirement when you make any request to slash product search. Um, we're going to return this data. Now I've actually done something here. This is suggested in the um, in the mock service worker docs. Um, what, what I'm doing here is I'm kind of implicitly proving that the search term comes through correctly as well. Don't really have enough time to, because I've only got a few minutes, so I don't really have enough time to massively go into that. But again, if you're curious, I can explain it on GitHub or reach out to me on LinkedIn or whatever. Um, so we return the data and what do we do here? So we render the product search component. We Again, we're using our um, accessible selectors. We're pulling out the search input. We pull out the search button. And then what we do is we simulate, we, we prove that, um, so what, what am I doing here? Yeah, yeah, we prove that the, yes, so we prove that um, the loading state doesn't occur. 
uh, and that we don't have any data uh, in the document from the products. And then what we do is we we type, uh, we, we use the um, user event type method, we type into the search import with the query, we click the button, we see that um, the loading state appears briefly, and then because it's asynchronous, what will happen is the loading state will then um, disappear. The reason you didn't see the lo loading state in the demo was because uh, mock service worker returns the data instantly if you don't put a delay in it, so that, that's why you're not seeing it. But in reality, you would see a delay and there would be a, a mini delay and you would see a loading state. And then I'm just asserting here, I've got a couple of helper methods that I just, uh, helper functions that just assert the data is as expected. Um, yeah, and so all well and good, but let's just have a look under the hood at how this works, because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you that we don't need, you don't need a one-to-one -one mapping between your tests and your implementation code. In fact, I hate to see it. So um, let's see here. So we've got our React query component here. And what this does is it pulls in, see this, it's got this queries hook, which comes from here. And that's got our, um, th this actually pulls in our data. So it makes a request, returns the data. Tests don't know or care how we're using it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you here what happens if I break it, products search. So here, I'm just gonna run the test and it all passes. But look what happens if I just go in and I don't know, I let's just, I don't know, I just won't return this data, I suppose. Um, should say, yeah, I mean, it just bombs out because it's not it's not displaying the data that it should. Um, well, I haven't tested this function uh, directly or this file directly. There's no explicit you know, product queries test. This is one of the mistakes I think that people often make. They think that, you know, I'm, I'm creating this thing. And if you think of that mentality, uh, I'm, I'm creating a unit, here is my unit. I need to test this unit in isolation. And this is how you end up in a mess because your tests too heavily tied to your implementation, right? So let, let's just show what how powerful this can actually be because in the same way that we did before, I've actually got a completely different implementation here that uses Redux Toolkit. So it's totally, the implementation is completely different. The API here is a totally different API. You can, again, you can inspect the code and see this for yourself. What actually happens under the hood is I have to, um, you wouldn't normally do this. You'd normally, if you were using something like Redux Toolkit, you'd have like a store at the top level of your application. So um, I bundled it, I kind of co-located it all together just to make it easier to inspect and look at. Uh, but what you can see here is we configure this store. This is all Redux stuff. So again, I'm not really going to go into it, but Redux has you create this store and then you have to create these services. And again, not going to explain, but the important thing is that the behavior is the same. And so again, in the same way that we could do before, uh, I can pull in the Redux version. Uh, let me do this, let me do this. So I'm going to say uh, Redux product search hit save, test pass. And again, if I go in and I change the Redux version and I break something, so I'll go into, I'll, I'll go into the uh, services. Um, I'll just, I'll just break this, whatever. I'll just do that. Test fails. Um, and so, yeah, if you, if you work in a, so I'm, I'm just looking at the time now and I think I've, I've I'm pretty much coming up to an hour. So I'm, I just want to do one final thing. And I think that um, I know that Valentina will approve because this is going to be the TDD bit. I just want to show a tiny bit of TDD because um, I can't make a talk without talking about uh, test-driven development. I just want to say before I do this, that this, this is something that I care about a lot. And I think the joy of TDD is the right way of kind of putting it because it's such a liberating experience when you, if you work in a way where your tests, where you're, you're going test first, and you're testing against behavior and not implementation details in this kind of way, you can you can live the dream. You can end up in this position where it's stress-free. You, you can trust your tests and you can make changes, and it's not it's not scary. Um, so let me. I'm just going to. I've got a little branch here. I'm going to reset here, and I'm just going to move. I have a branch TDD demo, and all I've done for this one. Uh, if I remember correctly. So I'm going to run the um, product search tests. And what I've done is I've just removed one feature and it's a pretty simple one, but I just want to show you the flow. So what have I done here? I've removed. So I'm saying a requirement is that this button should be disabled 
before uh, you in, until you type something. But right now you can see it's actually enabled, and because I'm, I'm mocking out data, it just returns no matter what, you know. Um, but you can see that this button is enabled, and I don't want that. I want it to be disabled. So um, until I start typing. So let's just do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all on my other screen, make sure that I've got the test written because live coding is scary. Uh, but what, <laughs> let's just do this. So I'm going to go, it should, you know what, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna pull the name of the test here. The, the way that I tend to work, um, like the vast majority of the time, I don't actually have, like, even though I'm working on the front end, I don't usually actually have the application open in front of me. I do when I'm doing visual stuff, when I'm doing HTML, CSS, or testing for things like accessibility. But when I'm testing behavior, I do 99% of it just like this. Um, and uh, this is actually how I work. So what I'll do is uh, let's do this and I'll do stick that there. Uh, and I just need to make this async. And I know that I am a little bit pushed for screen real estate. I'm just gonna, if you don't mind, and um, I will zoom in again in a moment. It's just so I can see what I'm doing. So. Uh, I will zoom in again in a second. Oh, this is GitHub Copilot trying to help me too much. Uh, that's annoying. But what I'm going to do, <laughs> it's actually right about the first bit. But I'll so I'm going to render the product search. And you know what? I'm just I'm going to paste this in from. I'm just going to paste it in as much as I'd like to type it all. Uh, but the flow is, we start with a failing test. So what are we actually doing here? So the search button should be disabled if the search input is empty. So what we do is we render the product search. We have, we use again our accessible um, select uh, accessible queries to get the search input and to, to get the button. We then say the search expect the search in input so search button to be disabled. Then we type something in and then we expect it to not be disabled. It's a pretty simple test. But you see here, uh, I'll zoom in. Uh, you can see here it says uh, it's failing because the received element is not disabled. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just gonna go in, and I think I'm still testing against the React Query version. Yep, so I'm gonna go in and I'm just going to, it's quite simple. Uh, so I'm just gonna go in here and basically I know because I wrote the code, uh, he says, I'm, I'm gonna forget now how to do this. <laughs> no, uh, I just need to do that. And if there's no search term, it's disabled. Hit save, test pass. And now I can go in here and look, it's disabled. Start typing, it's enabled. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, the, what I will do is I'll just quickly finish off on this Drive TDD slide again. Um, it really is like, I, I haven't worked late for 10 years and uh, because I don't need to, and you shouldn't need to, if you, if you write in a test first style and you test against behaviors, the trigger for writing new implementation code is a failing test. So you get this confidence that you're um, you're building up like a known good thing at each state and you have this really fast feedback loop. So as soon as you break something, you break it and in seconds you get this feedback and you see it happen. So these techniques do work. Um, Oh, there is one one bit left. I forgot. <laughs> sorry, um, but sorry about this. Yeah, there's one tiny bit left. Um, it's. I just want to talk about the back end for front end pattern. Um, I I'm still. If if um if you want me to stop, please just let me know. But I'll carry on just to talk about this quickly. Um, so this is a um an API kind of pattern that I'm particularly um, keen on. Um, and it works really well. And so what you often find in um, complex environments is that you will have um, you know, maybe the main level API. So what I'm talking about here is, oh, sorry, uh, let me just bring that back. Uh, that's annoying. Yeah, um, what I'm talking about here is, you know, you might have APIs that um, belong to the entire estate. So uh, some, you know, some organization that has products and, you know, maybe an orders API. Um, the products and orders are not specific to a specific product. You might have a mobile application, a front end app, so on and so forth, you know. Um, so we might be building a specific front end, say for the web. <clears throat> um, the way that I like to, to work and I've seen this work many times is that we would create what's called a back end for front end, which is a um, basically an API that's owned uh, by a specific front end team 
and it is specific to that user interface. And the way that I like to do it is that your front end only knows about that API. It, do, it doesn't know about any other APIs under the hood. Um, and you can put a lot of business logic in here. So, you know, if you had to, if you, if you imagine our product search uh, feature, let's say that, I don't know, we had to do some extra stuff to get the, um, uh, you know, to get, da -da -da, to get these tags to appear on the page or whatever. We could do that. We could do the business logic in our BFF. And if you do this, um, you end up with these simpler, uh, this simpler kind of front end architecture. And what's more, um, you actually get performance benefits as well. And they're not insignificant because uh, when I say performance benefits, you can return the exact shape data that you want for your application for whatever you need. So you can get rid of a lot of the um, data that you don't need. And that's not just um, data that you're saving on, because if you've got a complicated app and you were putting loads of um, logic to transform types and so on on the front end, actually that computation happens uh, on the client side. So if you imagine you've got a lower powered Android device um, and you've got loads of complicated stuff going on on the front end to transform data, that's actually uh, computationally expensive and happens on the client device. Doing it this way means you avoid that problem uh, and it's really nice. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to cover. Yeah. This was a really uh, exciting uh, presentation and I think we can see it by a huge number of people who stayed even, uh, even up to this moment. So yeah. it was really great to see all the TDD parts as well. So yeah. now we will be uh, jumping onto the questions. So let me see. Okay. How do you feel about the feedback that the testing libraries provide while doing TDD? Like, for example, testing library. Uh, I mean, I find it works extremely well. Um, as I say, I normally get feedback really quickly. I think if you're using the right selectors, you'll get the right um, error messages. Um, so, for example, you've seen examples there where, um, you know, I... I um, didn't have a label correctly associated, and it told me in the error message that that was the problem. Um, so generally speaking, um, I find it's an extremely good feedback loop and very fast, usually. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, great. And since you mentioned the point about speed, uh, typically what are some, I don't know, runtime durations to, let's say, run tens of tests or hundreds of tests or thousands of tests? Yeah. Um, so generally, when I'm working locally, I generally run in the watch mode. So I'm not usually running thousands of tests at once. Um, but obviously, when you go into CI, usually what happens then is that you'll run all the tests on CI. And so it will take a little bit longer at that point. One thing to mention is that Jest out of the box uh, will parallelize uh, tests for you. Um, but what it does is it, it runs the way that... Um, the parallelism runs uh, well, works in Jest is that it does it based on the files rather than the individual tests. So if you do have say one file with like loads of tests, then that's not going to benefit from those parallel runs. Um, also, there is a um, I think it's a relatively recent flag that was created in Jest that I think it's I can't remember the exact name of it. Something like run run since or something like that. So if you are having problems with speed, what it can do is it can look at um, you can basically tell it to run tests, only run tests from a specific commit, for example. So you can say from this commit to that commit, run these tests. Um, generally speaking, I, I find that React Testing Library and Jest are very rapid. Um, you can sometimes get into problems where you've got loads going on, um, but usually, again, I, I would actually argue that this is one of the good things about taking a test-driven approach, because what tends to happen is if you are going test-driven, and the, the test starts slowing down and annoying you, normally it's enough to annoy you that you, you have to fix it. And so you have to, it's like, well, why is it slow when you fix it? Whereas if you are if you treat tests as an afterthought, that can build up more easily. And um, hopefully that helps. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, next question. Uh, should use get by role? I think maybe this was referring <laughs> Was it get by label or get get by text? Not sure if anyone else remembers, but maybe some comments on that one. Yeah. 
thanks for spotting the deliberate error I put in there. I just wanted to make sure you're all paying attention. So no, but yeah, okay. I probably did make a mistake. That's fine. Yeah. This was good. Okay. I think uh, there is an extended version of this question mm -hmm. in the chat. Should we always find by role to test accessibility? Um, so generally, it's the it is the kind of recommended way to do it. There may be some uh, exceptions to that, but generally speaking, so in the in the just sorry in the React testing library documentation, there is somewhere there's a page somewhere that basically tells you the recommended priority order of these queries. And so if you if you refer to that, it will tell you. What, what queries you should be using in most circumstances. I've just realized there's a really good page as well, which I forgot all about actually, which is testing library playground. Um, and what this can do is, um, yes, yeah, so basically I think I must have used this ages ago and it's, 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 it's remembered something, but you can actually click in here and it will tell you what it thinks are the best selectors. So what you can do is you can take your, your markup, just paste it into here and it will tell you what it, what it recommends um, based on the rules uh, as well. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, next question uh, for get by text. There was an example with counter one. Uh, what happens mm -hmm. if it's a multilingual uh, application since here yeah, the word counter is coupled to the English language? How do we handle yep. any challenge when we couple the test to text visible on the screen as opposed to testing for the value one? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And it just reminded me that there is something I did kind of miss that I wanted to mention. So I did mention at one point that um, when you test in the application, there's a slightly different setup to when you test um, uh, using just the um, components directly. And what I mean by that, and again, I can document this in the uh, repository itself, but um, the way that um, we tend to, to work here is we create, and again, this is all documented in the um, React Testing Library docs. So if you go into the, uh, if you just read through the docs, they recommend doing things this way. And what actually happens is, um, can you see here, I'm creating, so I, I actually export a render method here. Um, so what we actually do is we export the entirety of, of React Testing Library, but with our custom render method. And what the custom render method will do is it will set up any providers that we need for the application itself. So if you if you just look at how I test the product search, um, can you see how there's a subtle difference here? I'm not actually importing directly from React Testing Library, I'm um, importing through these test utils. So to answer the question, uh, how would you deal with multilingual apps, which is a really good question, um, what I would typically expect is that you would have some kind of um, provider in, in, at this kind of level that would handle that transformation for you. And you would maybe set up your test in such a way that you, you, what I would probably do is have some specific tests that test the, the, um, the language support works as expected. And then I would probably have, you know, from that point on, you know, choose whatever language you want as the default, um, you know, and, and from that point on, you could continue to test in the same way. Does that make sense? Okay, so just to maybe summarize, the answer to the question is the end. You would, for example, um, explicitly have a provider for the language, and then in the test, you would set to use the English provider, and that's how you would be able to then explicitly write counter one because you're setting to telling the test, please use the English one, basically. Yeah. Oh yeah, or you might have some, I don't know, maybe depending on how you're doing it, you might have some JSON file that sets up all the language values, and then you would just pull in maybe the same value in, in the test itself. So rather than actually say counter one, you'd pull in, you know, the JSON value for whatever button it is and the, the name of that thing, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. I understand yeah. that then it would not be the hard-coded English value, but rather referencing maybe JSON by key or something like that. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so we do have the link here. I'm just clicking it yeah, uh, on GitHub yeah. and we will have it in the description as well so that anyone can have a look at this and start and maybe feel free to add any further comments to Paul there or any, I'm sure, ideas or change requests. Uh, let's yeah. see, next question. Uh, can someone paste the takeaway line he mentioned? Testing allows components to be easily changeable. Now, someone from us wrote 
Paul mentioned that good tests should give us the confidence to make changes over time. If your tests are passing, we should feel confident enough to go straight to production. So feel free to, I don't know, comment anything there regarding the key takeaway about testing. Yeah. No, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. I would agree with that. Right. I mean, obviously, I do. <laughs> yeah. You're great. Okay. <clears throat> I get it right that the mock service uh, worker library is not just uh, for mocking API for test purposes, but rather for any scenario where you need to mock API that's not yet available for maybe another team has not yet developed an API. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. You can it's it's very flexible. Um, you can use it however you want. Um, but yeah, essentially that's that's it. If you want to do that, if you're in that situation where maybe as a front end team, an API that we depend on isn't yet ready, then we can absolutely do that. Even if you're using a, a BFF, you know, so you have control over your own API, it may still be useful, um, or you can just return mock data from your BFF, but it gives you this really, it, it, it's very powerful in what it can allow you to do. And um, in the team that I'm currently working on, um, we have, I mean, to be honest, we use a slightly different setup because we return mocks from our BFF in that instance, because we're able to, but we actually set up a, um, a kind of developer tool that allows us to set up any uh, res any response from any API call. And it, it means that we can demo to stakeholders uh, different journeys um, because the application we're working on now is quite complicated in terms of the user journeys. Um, depending on different states and sub-states, we, we present a different journey to the user. But we can actually have this little tool that appears in the browser on um, non-production environments and people can just say, okay, well, I'm going to go on this page and return this data. Um, and that way, stakeholders can actually experience those journeys. Um, yeah. Okay, that has interesting usages. It's like the next step after Figma, perhaps. And then they can give uh, feedback earlier rather than having to wait for the full REST API. Yeah. And here hey, we have a yes. Certainly, use it to mock contracts for an API that doesn't exist, freeing you up from waiting for the API ready. So I think that's something that you clarified before, and it means we're not blocked by the backend yep. team. Struggle to wait for the loading state when using MSW. Yep. So um, there's a little trick to that, actually. Um, so it is a bit of a pain. Um, but what you can do, so uh, am I still, I'm not showing my screen now, but um, yeah, there's a delay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so where was the mock that I set up? So if I go to mocks, do, 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 no, so it's in handlers, isn't it? Yeah, so the little trick that you can do is this. So I wouldn't set it to 750. That was just so I could show a delay in the browser just to kind of illustrate the point. But you can just do even that, and it's 10 milliseconds. And what that will do is um, in your uh, you, when you're waiting for the loading state, it will actually appear in the kind of async flow of your tests. Um, it's a little bit, bit of a pain, but that's because they recently updated the user event library, so every action is asynchronous. But yeah, try that. It, it does work. Yeah. OK, great to see this. There's a solution. Uh, the next question, do you know of any libraries that work well with MSW so that the response uh, responses are not hard coded? In the past, I've used DFA to be a fixture builder. Yeah, I know I know of one. I haven't used it myself because um, oh, I think I'd have to, do you know what, if you can leave the question for me on the GitHub um, issue section of the repository and I'll answer that because I know, I think it's, I don't know if it's actually bundled as part of Mock Service Worker or it's, it's by the same team, but there is a library that you can use to do that. Typically, the way that um, I do things is I create these kind of mock functions. Uh, oh, this is this is taking me to the TypeScript type, but um, again, I can I can document this like how I how I generally do it. But I, I tend to take a um, kind of functional approach where you have, especially if you're using TypeScript. There's a few techniques I can I can show there, um, but yeah, in terms of um, libraries that are going to do it for you, I know that there is one that exists that I think was created by the same team. Um, but if you leave the question for me, I'll, I'll hunt it out for you and stick it on there. Okay, great. And maybe we could even have the answer later on YouTube in case uh, others have a similar question. Yeah. Uh, as well, providing sure. any other links that, that you have for anything else. 
Okay, yep. uh, going on to the next question. How do you make the counter accessible to go as far as using a live region? Uh, yeah, so this is a good question. And yeah, um, probably yes. I mean, I, to, for full disclosure, like I think that obviously accessibility is extremely important, but I don't consider myself a complete expert when it comes to it. And so typically what I do, but again, this is all, more, all the more argument for working in this kind of way where you're building components first. Because if I'm building that component, one of the first things I do is I start reading exactly how do we make uh, a counter accessible. I would expect that probably maybe you do need to use a live region, but I would read up on it. The, the W3C has really good resources on all of this stuff. And so typically what I do is when I'm building a new component, one of the first things I will look at is I'll go away and I'll read up, like how do I make this thing as accessible as possible? So I, I can't give the best answer to that other than to say, if you work in this way, you legitimately got the time to go out and figure that out. Mm -hmm, great. Yep. Uh, using MSW, should all handlers be in the handlers.ts and not protest? The argument being it might make the test more readable. I don't agree with that. Yeah. Um, so the way the way that I like to do it, and it's, it's always worked well for me in the past, is that in the handlers file, Typically, um, I would have kind of happy path uh, results, so 200, simple 200 responses. Um, and then in the tests themselves, I put any kind of specific things in there. So if I want to test error states or if I want to test, you know, different permuta permutations of data, I like to do it personally directly in the test. I don't like having to jump around um, too much. I find it quite annoying, so I like to kind of keep things uh, co-located and, and local just makes it easier to understand in my opinion okay and do you recommend any resource for learning test-driven development in react i did just re <laughs> i registered a domain name uh which is i think react with tdd.com but it doesn't exist yet there's nothing on there yet um this is one of the reasons i started talking about this and um, I do intend to write about it quite a lot, is that I don't know of any really good resource for, for that. There, there is um, one good resource in general for testing is, I think it's just called testingjavascript.com, and it was written by the guy who originally, I'm just double checking that, I think it's just testingjavascript.com. Um, he's the guy, uh, Kent C. Dodds, who originally um, created React Testing Library. It's since been taken over by a group of people, but um, he doesn't really talk too much about TDD, which I think is a, a bit of a shame, um, but he it is a good resource in general to learn how to write tests in this kind of way. In terms of uh, TDD itself, um, unfortunately, I don't know any outstanding resources, which is kind of why I want to start writing about it a little bit, because I think I can probably add some stuff there myself. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so these were great uh, questions up to now. If anyone else has anything, feel free to add, but maybe uh, ask additional questions. So maybe, I don't know, Daniel, Oliver, and Alina. So, so I asked you that already once. Um, what do you think about using IDs? I mean, IDs are probably more stable than um, then, for example, a label which can change. So, if you would start, if you yeah, would start with so the ID, and yeah, you know. Generally speaking, I mean, again, it, it's if you read the React, React Testing Library uh, advice on selectors, they generally say to try to avoid um, using IDs. What you can do, they they have um, an escape hatch, and it, they do refer to it as an escape hatch. So rather than using an ID, you can use a, what they call a data test ID. So it's a data attribute. Um, let me find this for you, give you an example. But if you see data test ID, you got testing library, um, you probably find, yeah, so you've got this by test ID here. And so rather than, like, I would use this generally as an escape hatch, but you can basically do this and make it specific for testing. Um, actually, when I first started um, using React Testing Library, I was using data test IDs for almost everything, but it, it turned out to be, you, you lose some of the benefits that you get from these more accessible selectors. Um, so you can just, 
if you're using, you know, get by label text and get by role and things like this, you start thinking in those terms as well. It just becomes almost automatic. Um, so I do think that overall you get more benefit by not using that. But if you um, are in a position where you have no other choice, um, then I would use a data test ID rather than an ID. I, re I really like it that you that you stress it so much the um, the accessibility part of it because that's something that many many developers especially with new, when you're a full stack developer and you do some back end some front end and you do everything a little bit um, that gets forgotten so it's really yeah, really and, cool to see it here yeah and ju just one thing to add to that as well um, while this is really good and like a really good starting point just doing this stuff doesn't necessarily guarantee that you've created an accessible experience. It's actually quite hard to get it right. It's actually a complicated thing. And as I said before, I don't see myself as a complete expert in that. I do think it's very important. And I, I like working with people who consider accessibility first. And it's a, it's, it's a first class citizen. Um, as somebody who is an able-bodied person who doesn't use uh, assistive technology, I can make mistakes, but I have the best you know, intentions and I'm always going to try and improve that um, as, I, as I can, you know. But yeah, it's it's a really good starting point to start by using these selectors. And I think, I mean, accessibility is really important. It's like about 30, 40% of the, of the people um, of the population have some form of accessibility issues. So it's very, very important that we actually focus on that. And usually it's just yeah. forgotten. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, another thing, another thing was um, about Cypress. I mean, Cypress can also intercept um, calls, especially when you have yep. component tests. Would you yep. recommend that also, or have you experienced um, that? Yeah, I mean, I I don't have a, a problem with with doing that. Um, the one, I guess, the one advantage that you get by using this technique uh, is that it helps actually during development as well, as in like you can, it's not just while you're running the test, you can actually see the experience and you can share that potentially with stakeholders and show them. Um, but yeah, using a mocking mechanism in Cypress is, is fine. Um, the way that we've done it in the application that I'm working actually on at the moment is despite me talking about the, the way that you can do this in mock service worker, we are using mock service worker in the BFF, sorry, in not the BFF, sorry, in the um, tests. But what we actually do is we have a mocking mechanism set up. We, we created our own little middleware. So you can um, send a header to our BFF and it will return um, a mock for you. One of the reasons that I like doing that is because like I'm a really big believer in continuous delivery and uh, having walking skeletons and all of this kind of thing. And at the very beginning of a project, what we, because I was lucky enough to start this project right in the beginning, and what we did was we built a walking skeleton. So if people are not familiar with that, it's a CI CD pipeline that can release to production on day one before you actually start building anything else, runs all your tests and everything. And one of the arguments that we, well, we, we worked very closely as a team, did a lot of mob programming, a lot of pair programming, big fan of all that kind of thing. Um, and what we discussed was that by doing that, it forced us to, to basically get the full connection working, including integration tests on CI. And when we deploy, we need to have the uh, communication between the front end and the BFF working um, right from day one. And so that was that's why I, I quite like that approach. But to be honest, like all of these techniques are going to work. It's, it's a judgment call. Uh, just understand the value you're going to get um, mm -hmm. from either technique. Great, thanks. Yeah. Cool. So... Great. Uh, yeah, this was, I think, a good discussion, and we even went uh, on to CICD and stuff like that. So, uh, Daniel and Alina, uh, any other uh, additional questions? I would have one question. Uh, yeah, what is your experience? I mean, you know, uh, with the, using TD on the front end. I mean, is there any scenario where you would say, yeah, you can't use TDD because of some constraint, speed, or I don't know, or you can use TDD for most of the front end? So, what's your experience in this? 
I, I've never experienced a scenario where TDD do, doesn't work on the front end. What I would say is that there are some scenarios where uh, you get the limitation of, say, Jest and JS DOM, because it is an in-memory DOM, so it's not 100% perfect. It's very good um, for 95 96% of everything you do. It's, it's spot on. But there are some scenarios. So a scenario might be something like scrolling behavior, for example. So mm -hmm. perhaps, I don't know, if you imagine an infinite scroll, so as you're scrolling down, it starts loading more data and that kind of thing. Because of the fact that it's an in-memory DOM, it's, it, it doesn't really work very well for those kinds of scenarios. So what I would typically do for um, any place where you do have those gaps, I would still test it. But the way that I would do it is I would push that up to um, Cypress level or um, something like Playwright. Playwright is a tool that I'm becoming more and more interested in. It's similar to Cypress, but it looks really exciting. Haven't played with it professionally yet. Um, but that's what I would typically do in that scenario. But I would never leave a feature untested. It's just, I can't even, it doesn't, it, 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 the, 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 the key thing for this for me is like, that's why I get to go home on time every day. It's why I'm so confident. There are some things that, some battles that are worth fighting, some, you know, I'm not as strict on some things, but when it comes to testing, um, one of the things that I typically do is, I mean, obviously now I know about mutation testing and so on, but previously I didn't know about that. And I would do a kind of manual form of mutation testing. So if I'm doing a PR review, I would pull somebody's, uh, pull somebody's branch down, run the tests, deliberately fail something, and see the tests so often they would just continue to pass because people are cheating and not test driving. And I would annoy people quite a lot with that, but I would never give in to that because mm -hmm. I need to have confidence. Um, that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We oh, have a comment uh, from Matthew. Changing hearts and minds is probably the hardest thing about moving toward TDD in the U.S. Oh. We Cheers. Change one of them. So this is really great to get to get this uh, feedback, and we do hope you know feel free to share this video with your uh, uh, colleagues and stuff like that. I mean, this is a really, I guess, hands-on practical video and uh, transformational too, so great to see this. And yeah. let's see, before we, Alina, uh, did you also have any question for Paul? Yeah, I think my question went in the same direction as Daniel's question, but maybe more, okay. less, less specific. Uh, maybe how, <laughs> how difficult is it to convince a team using TDD in front end? I don't have much experience on this one. Yeah, I mean, so it, it's interesting for me because I am, maybe I'm a little bit um, lucky in some ways because when I interview at places, I actually, I tend to bring this stuff up at the interview level. And I do think that um, an interview is a two, it's very much a two-way process. Um, and I'm not, I'm not just trying to get the job. I want to get the right role for, for myself. So it, it's fine for me if a team are not test driving um, when I join, but I'm gonna I'm gonna explain this stuff in an interview, and I'm gonna say this is like a really important thing. Here's why it matters, and I'm I'm happy to lead by example. Um, and you know, what is really nice to me is that I tend to I, I've made the mistake in the past of of just talking endlessly about TDD, 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 and you get to the point where people go cross-eyed and don't want to listen to you. And what, what I've discovered, or what a technique that's worked really well for me, is to talk in terms of delivery instead, and especially with product people. Because if I've got these tests that give me this, this high confidence, then we can live this agile dream, right? So like, you want to experiment with a new feature, I can build that feature and it's fine. Um, you change your mind about how something works, it, it's fine, I can change it because the cost of change is low. So if you, if you can connect um, these techniques to delivery, and, and it, there's no smoke and mirrors because it does work, um, then uh, that tends to work really well in my experience. Yeah. Excellent argument. I like how you brought up the topic both about interviews and uh, leading by example. So this is really uh, great to hear all this. So I just want to say uh, thanks again, Paul. This was a, a really excellent presentation and we all uh, learned a lot i mean both uh, conceptually 
And it was great how you had the whole series of uh, practical examples. So I'm sure that this will be great uh, for uh, everyone to rewatch, maybe even multiple times and try to apply in practice and share with, uh, with your colleagues. And also we will be adding the, the links to the GitHub in the description of the video soon. And also whoever has any additional questions, feel free to add it on uh, YouTube. So I just want to say um, thanks. Thanks again, Paul. It was really great. No problem. Thank you for having me. It's really good. You're great. Thank you. Yeah. And just to finish off, so uh, thanks everyone again for joining our meetup. Uh, you can join us on uh, Register on Meetup, subscribe here on YouTube, and follow us on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and GitHub. So that's all. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.